In this video, I'll be sharing everything I've uncovered about Chapter 6, Unfinished, and exploring how it ties into Journey to the West. If you spot any inaccuracies or have additional insights, feel free to let me know, and sorry in advance for any mispronunciations. By the way, Tanzen, Tripitaka, and the monk all refer to the same person. It's referring to the monk who Wukong accompanied on their journey west. The secret ending animation from chapter 6 is the destined one regaining Wukong's memories. Upon completing the secret ending, that is defeating Erlang before the Great Stone Sage, we gain access to Wukong's mind relic, and hence access to Wukong's memories. The events are shown in reverse order. The first scene is the aftermath of the battle between Erlang and Wukong, that is the fight that takes place in the prologue. Here, Erlang reveals that it doesn't matter whether Wukong becomes a Buddha or not, the headband had always been there, to which Wukong replies, watch me rip it off and break free. We then go back in time to after the pilgrims complete their journey west, and we see the Buddha acknowledging Wukong's deeds and granting Wukong the title of victorious fighting Buddha. Although his headband disappears here, we know that it was merely hidden and not completely removed. The scene then goes further backwards in time showing the events that take place from chapters 47, 48, and 49 in Journey to the West. The pilgrims come to Heaven Reaching River, a river too wide to cross or even see the other side. The pilgrims spend a night at the village on the banks of the river. There they help the villagers with subduing a demon. After defeating the demon, the great white turtle offers to take the pilgrims across the wide river to thank them for getting rid of the demon. The next scene takes place in chapter 87. The people of Fangxian have suffered a horrible drought for three years. Wukong travels up to heaven to look into the problem. The gods explain that the drought was a punishment because they had greatly disrespected heaven in the past. The Jade Emperor set up three items, a rice mountain, a flower mountain, and a golden lock. The rice and flower must be nibbled by a chicken and dog, and the lock to be burnt by a small flame. All three conditions must be met before the rain can be permitted again. The next scene takes place in chapters 78 and 79. Arriving at the kingdom of Bikshu, the pilgrims notice that there were hundreds of cages with children inside on the streets. They learn that years ago, a Taoist priest presented his beautiful daughter to the king of Bikshu. The king soon became terribly sick, and the Taoist said that the hearts of 1,111 children could make an elixir to cure him, and that's why the king ordered all those children to be caged to be sacrificed. The next scene depicts the rock demon. The rock is a giant bird demon. In chapter 77, Wukong battles three demons, and the rock demon is one of them. The three demons were too powerful for Wukong and Wukong sees that he has no choice but to seek the Buddha to help him subdue the powerful demons. The Buddha then helps subdue the rock demon. This scene takes place in chapter 67. Tuolu village is being terrorized by a demon who has been ruining the lives of the people. Wukong agrees to help them rid the monster. That night, the demon arrives at the village, hovering in the air. Wukong and Pigsy fly up to meet and duel him. Unable to withstand both of them, the demon flees back to his home. Wukong and Pigsy chase the demon to the Seven Extremes mountain, where they find the demon in its original form, a giant red python. The python demon swallows Wukong whole, and Wukong kills the python from the inside. The next scene shows the Nine-Headed Beast, which appears in Chapter 63. Wukong and Pigsy travel to the demon's lair at Emerald Wave Lagoon. There they encounter the Nine-Headed Beast. 
With the combined strength of Wukong and Pixie, Nine Heads could not hold up for long and retreated. Wukong and Pixie then happened to stumble across Erlang and his brothers. Wukong asks them for a quick hand to defeat the Nine-Headed Beast. Pixie lures Nine Heads out of the water for Erlang to make his move. Erlang shoots at the monster with his bow and his dog jumps to bite off one of the monster's head. Nine Heads, now eight, flees in fear never to be seen again. The next scene is from chapters 57, 58, and 59. Sandy sees two monkeys, one at Guanin's place and the other at the Flower Fruit Mountain. The monkey at Guanin's place goes with Sandy to confront the other monkey at Flower Fruit Mountain. The real and fake monkeys duel for many days. Both were completely on par with each other in strength and abilities. The two monkeys battled their way across heaven and earth. Nobody, not even Guanin, Tripitaka, or Heavenly King Lee's demon reflecting mirror could distinguish them in any way. Eventually, the two monkeys make their way to the Buddha. The Buddha identifies the fake monkey to be the six-eared macaque. In frustration, Wukong kills the macaque before returning to Tripitaka. The next scene depicts the single horned rhinoceros king who captures Tanzen, Bajie, and Sandi. While fighting the Yaogwai, Sun Wukong loses his staff after the Yaogwai uses a giant magic ring to suck it away from him. Sun Wukong then seeks help from various celestial forces including Li Jing, Neza, and the 18 Arats, but all of them also lose their weapons. The Yaogwai is eventually revealed to be Tai Sheng Laozheng's steed, the Azure Bull, who had stolen his master's magic ring and used it to cause trouble. Tai Sheng Laozheng shows up to subdue the Azure Bull and take back his magic ring. The next scene I believe takes place in chapters 44, 45, and 46. Here the pilgrims reach the Kartslow Kingdom, where the Taoists arrange a contest to play against the pilgrims. Tripitaka is challenged to a meditation contest and a game of guessing items inside a cabinet. With Wukong's help of secretly sabotaging the Taoists' moves, the pilgrims win both games easily. The Taoists then begin to wage life-threatening contests which include chopping off heads, cutting open abdomens, and bathing in boiling oil. With Wukong being immortal, he volunteers to participate and wins each challenge, while the Taoists lose their lives. As they die, the Taoists are revealed to be a tiger, deer, and goat demons. I think this next scene is when Wukong nearly dies from all the smoke and flames from Red Boy's Samadhi fire and Pigsy resuscitates Wukong. The next scene depicts Tanzan using the mantra to constrict Wukong's headband, causing him pain. The scene is from chapter 27. The white bone demon heard that eating Tripitaka's flesh would grant immortality. In an attempt to catch Tripitaka, she transforms into a young lady to approach him. However, Wukong sees through her disguise and hits her with a staff. She uses the same trick another two times, transforming into an old woman and old man before Wukong ultimately kills her on the third attempt. She reveals her true identity to be Lady Whitebone. The next scene is from chapter 24. The pilgrims arrive at Five Villages Abbey. The Taoist lads who were looking after the abbey while their master was away present to Tripitaka two ginseng fruits, a baby-shaped fruit which grants immortality when consumed. Believing that the fruits were newborn babies, Tripitaka rejects them in horror. The Taoist lads eat the two fruits themselves and are overheard by Pigsy. Pigsy tells Wukong of the rare fruit in the abbey and asks him to steal the fruit to have a taste. Wukong sneaks into the garden and picks three ginseng fruits. He returns and shares them with Pixie and Sandy. The Taoists of the Abbey scold the pilgrims for stealing their fruits. Out of anger, Wukong uproots the entire ginseng fruit tree. The next scene is from chapter 22. The pilgrims reach Flowing Sand River where they are attacked by Sandy. Pixie and Sandy duel for many rounds and in the end, Tripitaka ends up taking Sandy as his disciple. The next scene is when Tanzan frees Wukong from the mountain that the Buddha trapped him under. Following that we see the events that happened before Wukong was trapped under the mountain, where Buddha challenges Wukong to a bet that if Wukong could escape out of his palm, he could assume the throne of heaven. Wukong leaped and soared through the air, and after a long time he saw five enormous pillars. He landed in front of them, and plucked two of his hairs and turned them into a brush and a jar of ink. On one of the pillars he wrote, Sun Wukong was here. Afterwards, he pees on one of the pillars. Little did he know he was still on Buddha's palm. 
The next scene is from chapters 4, 5, and 6. Wu Kong is appointed in heaven to be a horse keeper. After learning that his rank was insultingly low, he returns to Flower Fruit Mountain in anger. He proclaims himself the great sage equaling heaven and rebellion against heaven. The pagoda bearing heavenly King Li leads an army of celestial soldiers to arrest Wu Kong. Wu Kong easily defeats the best of these warriors, including Prince Neza. The Jade Emperor then sends Venus to invite Wu Kong to heaven again, this time to take the position of Great Sage equaling heaven. Later, however, Wu Kong learns that he is not invited to the Immortal Peach Banquet. He goes there anyways and begins to eat everything before the banquet has ever begun. He proceeds to drink all the Imperial wine and consumes all the Golden Elixir. The Jade Emperor in Fury deploys a force of a hundred thousand soldiers to arrest Wu Kong. Wu Kong and his army, the Seven Great Sages, beat them all, and they are forced to withdraw. As a final resort, Guan Yin recommends the Jade Emperor to dispatch Erlang, Heaven's strongest general to arrest Wu Kong. Wu Kong and Erlang duel for many days. This next scene is from Chapter 3. In the Underworld, Wu Kong wreaks havoc and removes his own name from the Register of Life and Death, so that his soul would not be managed by anyone else. The next scene goes further back to when Wu Kong becomes brothers with the Seven Demon Kings and together they are the Seven Great Sages. They drink wine as they prepare to crash the Celestial Palace, and that pretty much sums up the secret ending animation for Chapter 6. Alright, so we know that the higher beings in Black Myth Wukong are not moral beings. They use the souls of Yaoguais to achieve and maintain their immortality, hence the title Black Myth. It's a blackened version, a darker version of Journey to the West. After Wukong finishes his journey west, Buddha grants him the title of Victorious Fighting Buddha. However, the golden headband still remains. One explanation as to why the headband remains might be because of the way the pilgrims attained Buddhahood. Normally, the process of becoming enlightened takes many lifetimes. However, for the pilgrims, the process was somewhat sped up. They were able to achieve enlightenment by completing 81 trials. It may be that because of this process, the enlightenment they achieved was merely superficial, hence why the golden headband never fully disappeared. Again, it's merely speculation though. And then I believe Wu Kong, after he attains Buddhahood, learned about the higher being's source of immortality, and that might be the reason why Wu Kong chose to give up his Buddhahood. I'll go into more detail on this later on, but essentially he wanted to give up his immortality in Buddhahood, and then the Celestial Palace would not allow Wu Kong to do so because he knew too much. He mentions this in the prologue as well. Wu Kong says, Those high above me don't trust me. I understand that. And they send you and those knuckleheads to threaten me to obey and serve once more. I understand that too. During that fight, Erlang then follows up and says, The victorious fighting Buddha, have you any idea how many would give their everything for immortality? Wukong replies, Immortality? For that word, all realms and beings have ruined themselves. Sun Wukong realized that as long as the golden headband remained, he would never have free will. Now the person that put the headband on Wukong at least in Journey to the West, was the monk Tripitaka, and Tripitaka obtained the golden headband from Bodhisattva Guanin. As far as I can tell, it wasn't the Buddha himself who was responsible for the golden headband. Regardless, in Journey to the West, the headband actually disappears, and in the game Black Myth Wukong, the headband actually remains on Wukong. So Sun Wukong's death wasn't just a dramatic exit, it was his ticket to freedom. Now as long as Wukong's six senses were intact, the headband wasn't going anywhere. So Wukong hatched a plan, scatter his six senses and set up a path for the destined one to follow. This new journey to the west would lead to reuniting all six senses, and only once all six senses were reunited would Wukong be reincarnated without the headband. His mind relic, however, was hidden under the control of Erlang. Only by beating Erlang do we gain access to the final relic, the mind relic, which reveals the memories of Wukong, the ones that we see in the final animation. Now Erlang set up different trials throughout the chapters for the destined one to complete, and only upon completing the secrets tied to each chapter were we able to access the fight with Erlang and get the true or secret ending, the one where the headband stays off and Wukong's reincarnation has free will. 
However, if we don't get the final relic piece, the Destined One ends up with the headband and it kicks off another cycle, which keeps on repeating until the Destined One finally cracks the code and gets the last relic. Erlang's true intentions become apparent when we look into his journal entry. In skies high his talents shine, like plum blooms pure and bright. His form defies the winter's snow, a sacred being of light. With lofty heart he claims no kin to the emperor above. His noble spirit dims the stars unlocking the great pagoda. These are just monkeys, none of them has anything worthwhile. A celestial soldier used his spear to flip over a corpse, complaining to his fellow. Before them lay the aftermath of the battle at Mount Huago. Jagged rocks, ancient trees charred by lightning, and bodies strewn across the landscape. The good stuff is all in the water curtain cave. We only get to clean up the battlefields, replied the fellow. True, we just do the dirty work, finishing off those who aren't quite dead yet. With that, the celestial soldier thrust his spear into a corpse and pulled it out again. They methodically checked each body until they reached a large boulder. The celestial soldier knocked on the stone. Watching thus, his fellow said, it's just a rock, what do you expect to find out of it? The celestial soldier replied, Don't you know, thus says Sun Wukong. The fellow looked puzzled. Nonsense, how could this be Sun Wukong? He died earlier, with his six roots severed and given to the Yaogwai kings. Born from a stone, and now, with his senses gone, he naturally turned back into the stone after death. Bollocks, said his fellow. You don't believe it? The celestial soldier boasted. I was at the front of the formation and saw it clearly. When they dismembered his body, even the sacred divinity took a piece, aka Erlang taking the mind relic. The fellow, curious, asked, I don't remember you being at the front, is that true? Even the sacred divinity took a piece? I saw all those Yaogwai kings from the lower realms today. I thought only Yaogwai would take things from other Yaogwais. He's not just any Yaogwai, he was once granted Buddhahood, corrected the celestial soldier. Why would the sacred divinity take that? Isn't it considered bad luck? Who knows, Sun Wukong was powerful. Maybe consuming it would be highly beneficial. They both laughed heartedly. Hey, look at this, said the fellow, noticing something white beside the stone. They picked it up and found it was a branch of plum blossoms, as white as jade, as pure as snow, blooming fragrantly. The celestial soldier wondered, how could there be plum blossoms on Mount Huago? The fellow said, this looks somewhat like. Before he could finish, a spearhead pierced through his chest emitting a golden light that even dispersed the soul within his armor. The celestial soldier looked over his fallen fellow's shoulder. Shocked, before he could react, the golden light flashed again. White clouds drifted past, leaving the mountain peak in tranquility once more. Basically, Erlang killed the two soldiers. He didn't want to leave any witnesses alive who knew about him possessing the mind relic. AKA Erlang was actually a good guy. Erlang mentions in his opening cutscene, right before we fight him, I can't kill that monkey, no one can except himself. Meaning Wukong killed himself, not Erlang, not the Celestial Court, not the Yao Guas. Once we defeat Erlang, the mind relic starts coming out of Erlang's third eye, and we get a glimpse into one of Wukong's memories. I did my best to transcribe what I was able to understand. I hear tell this Yao Guai is I rank a thousandfold above that king. As his sire, he reveres me, and like a deity, he serves me. Oh dear, I think I'm his slave. Kindly chant the loosening spell and release that, Tathagata, so that you can take back my head man. Only I can be free. That Yagwai said he knew he sought. Surely he is no mere mortal. He must be somebody from the court. Great. The journey ends here. The eyes wide to bring him to hell. Watch me rip it off. So first off, Tathagata is the Buddha. I'm pretty sure it's this Buddha right here that we see in the ending cutscene. So basically Wukong went over to the Buddha and asked him to remove the headband and it seems like the Buddha didn't comply. Now the only thing I'm confused about is the timeline. I don't know if these events took place right at the start of Journey to the West, which I mean it's a possibility. Like Wukong just got his headband on and he went straight to the Buddha to ask him to remove it. If that's the case, it's no big deal. But if this memory is from after the journey, then it raises some questions as to why like the Buddha didn't remove the headband. Which means that at some point after the journey, Wukong actually became aware that he had the headband on. Again, I'm not sure exactly what timeline it falls into, but that was probably the most notable thing I noticed. And moving on, Erlang says, The win is his. My brothers tested you at my behest. 
all for this day. And only now I understand that fight. No prestige can shackle him. No band can keep him caged. A mortal death for an unbound mind and will. May you not fail him. I am now at peace. Your journey though has just begun. All those Yaugwais guarding the secrets in each chapter were sent by Erlang to test every iteration of the Destined One. So that one day, one Destined One would eventually gain the Mind Relic and be free from the Golden Headband. Alright, so in the little poem for Erlang in the journal entry, it says, He claims no kin to the Emperor above. I'm going to dive into Erlang's backstory to get an understanding of why that's the case. Erlang Shen directly translates to Second Sun God. His mother, Princess Yaoji, was the sister of the Jade Emperor. Now Erlang's mother, she secretly wed a mortal man and gave birth to Erlang Shen. However, the laws of the Heavenly Court forbade gods from marrying mortals. Now when the Jade Emperor discovered her marriage, he sent his heavenly armies to kill the Half-Bloods, the mortal man and the goddess. Only Erlang and his sister Yang Chan survived. Erlang then went to search for a worthy teacher that could impart to him the necessary skills and powers to save his mother. Meanwhile, the Jade Emperor imprisoned his mother under the Peach Mountain as punishment. Years later, the grown-up Erlang Shan cleaved the mountain using his axe, hoping to set his mother free. Unfortunately, ten sun gods, the Jade Emperor's sons, arrive and burn her to death. Overcome by rage and grief, Erlang killed nine of the sun deities, but was persuaded to release the last sun god by the moon goddess's handmaiden. And that is why Erlang isn't necessarily fond of the Jade Emperor. Which could possibly also explain why he helps Wukong. The next journal entry is for the Great Sage's Broken Shell. Three Yangs converge. Life springs forth anew. The celestial stone holds sun and moon's hue. From an egg a monkey's path is laid. A future arises with this form made. Within no form to recognize. Without a shape before everyone's eyes. Talented ones emerge through ages. How few achieved the Tao among kings and sages. The table was a mess and after three rounds of drinks, the two sitting across from each other were completely hammered. Bajie, my brother, I'm done being the victorious fighting Buddha. Whoever wants the damn title can have it, Wukong said, his face red and blood boiling. It was unclear whether he was truly drunk or just pretending. Bajie, straightforward as always, replied, Brother, enlightenment we've attained. Being free, we can drink to our heart's content. Shouldn't we be happy? Wukong sneered. Yes, attaining Buddhahood for the removal of my headband was indeed a good deal. Exactly, with the headband gone, you don't have to fear master chanting anymore. Doesn't call for two more toasts? Bajie said, still trying to persuade Wukong to drink more, despite his own muddled state. Bajie, you enjoy drinking. But, if someone wanted to have you served as their side dish for drinking, would you still be this happy? Who wants to eat me? My nine-tooth rake won't allow it. Bajie said, slamming the table. Well, that would be much more difficult than you think. Wukong waved his hand dismissively, his face disdainful. If they wanted to eat you, there wouldn't even be bones left. They? Who are you talking about? Let me ask you, on our journey, how many Yaugwes did we encounter? And how many did we kill? Too many, lost count, remember? Whenever you get bored or lazy, you'd send me to clear out those caves and lairs. Not counting the lesser ones, how many of the powerful ones did we kill? I don't remember, probably killed them all. Setting aside the tree guys from the wood immortal hut and those seven spiders, we killed less than half of the ones we fought. Seven? Seven spiders? Oh, I remember now. The other half we didn't kill, do you know why? Why? Because we mustn't kill them. Hmm, that was before. Now we're celestial beings ourselves. If it pleases us, we can go kill them now. Wukong sighed. Bajie, why don't we resign from our positions and retire? I'll go back to my mountain and you can return to your village. Bajie was stunned, not understanding why Wukong suddenly changed the topic. I'm not going back. If you want to leave, go ahead. Now, I don't have to lift a finger. And there's an endless supply of tributes and all kinds of delicacies. If I go back, I'll have to work the fields. I can't bear the toil. These tributes should go to those who need them more. If we eat them, those people will have less to eat. What happened to you? Weren't all our struggle just for thus? Don't tell me you wish to go begging for alms with a master like before. Forget it. Forget it. Let's drink. Bajie couldn't remember when Wukong left the table. Before he blacked out from drinking, the last thing he remembered his brother said was, Immortality, it's not for me. 
Now Wukong says, Bajie, you enjoy drinking, but if someone wanted to have you served as their side dish for drinking, would you still be this happy? I think this is referring to the Yaogwais being turned into pills for immortality, and Wukong at some point realized this. Let me ask you, on our journey, how many Yaogwais did we encounter, and how many did we kill? Now although the journey west was to bring the scriptures, Wukong realized that he, a Yaogwai, ended up killing countless other Yaogwais. All for what? A title? Or maybe that's what the higher ups wanted all along, using a Yaogwai to get rid of other Yaogwais. They viewed Yaogwais as nothing more than just food. During the opening cutscene, when we head down to the boat, right before the stone monkey fight, the elder monkey reflects on Wukong's past and draws parallels to how Wukong's acts mirrored the Yaogwai kings we fought in each chapter. Wukong was far from perfect. He was very childlike and had a short fuse. Even throughout Journey to the West, Wukong would act impulsively and then later regret his actions. That's probably what happened here as well. He believed what he was doing was right because after all, he was doing these things while endorsed by the Buddha. Only later did he come to realize just how wrong he was. Now in the process of heading to the stone monkey fight, Bajie says, I knew it from the beginning. You were the mind of Wukong all along. The elder says, not me, it's him. Bajie says, don't make me laugh. Him? He's Wukong? The elder says, yes and no. After Wukong died, five of his six senses endured and were taken by the Yaogwai. Only his mind was lost. Mind is the first of the six. It's the essence unique to every life. Therefore, it's destined to fade away at life's end. Now, he clearly lied because we're able to gain the mind relic and it does reveal most if not all of Wukong's past memories. I'm not sure if the Elder Sage lied because he didn't know, or if he was in on it but didn't want us to know. I experienced this cutscene before killing Erlang, so I'm not sure if the dialogues are any different if you come here after killing Erlang. That being said, he is the one who doesn't put the headband on us if we complete the requirements for the secret ending, so maybe he was in on it all along. One thing I will mention is that this Elder Monkey, at the very start, he doesn't have this ribbon arc behind him. But towards the end, he does have it. And basically what this symbolizes is enlightenment. So at some point, between Wukong's death and now, the monkey became enlightened. Alright, the next thing I want to touch on is the war between the Celestial Palace and Bodhisattvas. I'm not going to say Buddhas because I don't think any Buddha has been involved in like any corrupt schemes. The only ones that have been involved have been Bodhisattvas and they're not technically Buddhas. Now throughout the chapters there is a conflict between the Bodhisattvas and the Celestials. For instance, in chapter 2, the Yellow Wind Sage was forced to serve under Ling Ji as punishment and Yellow Wind Sage severed Ling Ji's head and got revenge. Now the way the Yellow Wind Sage was able to do this, the way he was able to overpower Ling Ji, was because he gained access to one of Wukong's relic. And we're told that the relic was distributed by the Celestial Court to the Yaogwais who participated in defeating Wukong, aka Black Bear, Yellow Wind Sage, Yellow Brow, Hundred Eyed Taoist, and Bull King. Meaning that the Celestial Court was the reason the Yellow Wind Sage was able to behead Bodhisattva Lingji. Similarly, in Chapter 4, the Crane Immortal, aka the Celestial Court, gave the Hundred Eyed Taoist the Golden Cocoons which were used to corrupt Bodhisattva Pilanpo's son, Maori. Now Maori was the previous Dawn Star constellation, and it's not directly mentioned, but I believe Pilanpo was also injured if not killed through a similar means. Now regardless, both these systems are somewhat corrupt. If you look at the Celestial Court, their system is, if you don't follow their ways, they kill you. And the prime example is Wukong. Wukong decided to resign his title of Victorious Fighting Buddha so that he may live a free and peaceful life. However, the Celestial Court would not allow it, possibly because Wukong knew too much, so they gave him the ultimatum, either join them or die. Similarly with Bodhisattvas or Buddhism I guess, if you disrespect Buddhism, you get punished. And the prime example is from Chapter 2, where the King of Flowing Sands chose to worship the Yellow Wind Sage instead of Buddhism, and as a result, the people were turned into Rat Yaogwais. Alright, I'm going to cover some journal entries that I found amusing or that had like relevant information. The first one is from the Emerald Armed Mantis. The journal entry says that at Kyumu's abode, upon learning of the princess's suffering and her reluctance to leave due to her feelings for the Yaogwai and children bore for him, Sun Wukong ordered Bajie to throw the Yaogwai's children from the heights. 
reducing them to two lump of flesh. That's pretty dark. Basically, Kiyomu, who was a Yaogwai, had married a princess. And the princess was suffering, but she was reluctant to leave because of the feelings she had for the Yaogwai and the children that she had with them. So Wukong basically ordered Bajie to kill their children, and it sort of highlights some of the darker deeds that Wukong did on his journey west. By the way, if Kyumu sounds familiar, it's because he's mentioned in Kang Jin Loon's journal entry. And then Cloud Treading Deer's journal entry says, Immortals often say that Sun Wukong was at his most mischievous and ruthless when he was the Monkey King. Yet during that time, aside from his battles with the Celestial Court, he rarely harmed other beings. It was only after he became a disciple, following his master and gaining direction, that he developed many thunderous methods. Stealing, robbing, kidnapping, killing, arson, and destroying mountains and caves all became second nature to him. So yeah, as cool as Wukong is, he definitely has a darker side to him. Even he acknowledges this to some extent in the Great Sage's journal entry, where he discusses with Bajie about how many Yaogwais they killed and wanting to retire and give up the title of Victorious Fighting Buddha. The other one I found cool was the Son of Stones. This little guy, or rather big guy, was sent by his mom, the Mother of Stones, the one from Chapter 2 to search for his father. Now according to Celestial Laws, the mountain deities are forbidden from leaving their designated mountains without just cause. So the mother had no choice but to send her son to look for the father. Unfortunately, the son went in the opposite direction and ended up at Mount Huago. There he got distracted by the Feng Tail General and he would sit on the mountain, watching the cricket soaring leaps and appealing it. That's why we see him clapping at the mountain cliff. He was watching the grasshopper. And that's kind of it, the main stuff relating to chapter 6. I can't wait for the DLC and or sequel. Part of me is hoping that we get to see some characters like Neza or the Jade Emperor. I mean, hopefully we get to invade the Celestial Palace, that would be pretty sick. We also haven't seen Sandy at all, so maybe Sandy will make an appearance for the DLC or the sequel and then join us and Bashiye on our journey. Regardless, I cannot wait. <laughs> Goku, you're lucky,